I reluctantly agreed to allow him to use my big pulpit over here. Uh, not many get to use it, so, uh, but he and his wife Ricky, who came with him, uh, work with the Hallsville congregation in Hallsville, Kentucky. Uh, he is the one who established that congregation in 2000 and has worked with them since. Uh, has a very good congregation there as he continues that work. He's a graduate of the East Tennessee School of Preaching, has done local work in Ohio and Kentucky, and mainly his work has centered around the mission fields here in the United States and going into a location like he did at Hallsville and establishing a congregation from scratch and uh, getting that church going and growing. And that's very hard work and appreciate him for that. He has written some lesson commentary books, one on Hebrew and one on Daniel. Uh, he's been working on a a book on uh, mission work as well. So know that he's going to be uh, bringing us a good lesson on the subject of the New Covenant from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Well, anyway, there we go. Big difference. Now i got to start all over again. I consider this subject one of the most, if not the most, important lesson in this series. Now, don't think I'm being arrogant on that. Well, brethren, if you don't think your lesson is the most important lesson in the series, you better start over again. Because you're going to do a better job if you think it's the most important lesson in the series. But because of all the ignorance when it comes to covenants, the religious world is divided today. 
kind of a hunt and pick way of trying to find your way of salvation. It was two years ago that Ricky and I was having a Bible study with a young family in Lewisport. A man and his son and a little boy was just uh, following every step that his dad made. If his dad did this, the little boy did this. If his dad picked up a pen, the little boy picked up a pen. And we studied, and on the third lesson, I usually have a lesson on covenants. If you want to study personal work with someone, you best be prepared to have a lesson on covenants because they don't understand the idea. And we had the lesson on covenants, and he said, you mean to say that, that we're not supposed to keep the Ten Commandments? And I go, yeah. Because I can't study with you anymore. Thought I was a heretic. For you see, he had not been introduced to the New Covenant. Oh yes, he understood about the New Testament, but he had not been introduced to the New Covenant. And this is something that we must introduce people to and then also reaffirm this teaching among our brethren. If you understand the ideal of covenant, then you'll know that anyone that is not following the teaching of Christ, absolutely they're lost. Because they're not in covenant relationship with the Lord. Now the word covenant is used in the Old Testament some 52 times. The Lord says, my covenant. And by the way, it is His covenants that we're talking about. That when it comes to covenant making, when God makes a covenant, He sets the standards. And we have the obligation to abide by that standard or not to abide by that standard. If we want the blessings that come along with that standard, we must abide by that standard. First appears in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 18, when God established His covenant with Noah so He could enter the ark, His wife and His sons and their wives. And that's the first time the word appears in the Scriptures. Then again in Genesis 9, with the covenant of the rainbow, that God's not going to destroy the earth anymore by flood. So we have this. Now, the new covenant first appears in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Now let's read about this new covenant. And by the way, I want you to follow along with me. We'll have a lot of reading. I like to hear pages move when I'm going through the Bible. If you don't have your Bible with you, grab a songbook and, and, and move the pages. And then the next time, reprint and bring your Bibles. Okay? It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judea not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people." No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know Me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquities and their sin I will remember no more. Now it's extremely important that when we look at this here, where He talks about this new covenant, the ideal of this new covenant in Jeremiah 31 implies an old covenant. Now we mentioned about the covenant with Noah. Is it talking about that covenant? No. Well, God made a covenant with Abraham. Is it talking about that covenant? No. God made a covenant with the nation of Israel, and that's the covenant that we're talking about here being the old covenant. Now the old covenant and the new covenant, or the Old Testament and the New Testament, must be handled correctly. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, to study, to show thyself to prove unto God a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
In other words, when we pick up God's Word, God expects us to handle it correctly. If I want to answer the question, what must I do to be saved, I cannot go back to the Ten Commandments and look at that and follow that and try to keep that law to be saved today. We must handle the Word of God correctly, rightly dividing the Word of truth. I know an individual that was studying with some boys and he asked them to, what, to, to, to tell them what they needed to do to be saved. And, and they said, well, let's just go back and let's just keep the Ten Commandments. Well, if the Ten Commandments could save you, there would have been absolutely no need for Jesus to come. There would be no need for the cross. There would be no shedding of the blood if that would happen. Now, as we look at the Old Covenant, we talk about the covenant that God made with the nation of Israel at the time of Moses and Mount Sinai that it came from God. God was the author. For a holy man of God spoke as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. That God is the author of the Old Testament. God is the author of the New Testament. God established the Old Covenant. He established the New Covenant. Everything comes from God. It was made with Israel. God did not make it with their fathers. Now, let's hear some pages. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Yeah, I'll pick up those Bibles. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, let's start with verse 1. And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I spoke in your hearing today, that you may hear them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb, the mountain of God. And the Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. This covenant was not in force until it was established on Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. It was not in force. People have tried to say that the seventh law, it was all the way back when God rested Not the case. It did not come about as far as being part of God's covenant law until He established this covenant with the nation of Israel. Now as we look at this covenant that God established with the nation of Israel, well you can say, well how do we know that's the Ten Commandments? And by the way, it, all that Moses talked about there, I talked to Brother Brantley about this, but we're going to focus in on the Ten Commandments in this lesson. And that's going to stand for all of the laws that Moses received. Because that's the stumbling block that people have today when it comes to rightly dividing the word of truth. It was written on two tablets of stone. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13. Now notice what the Bible says. And so he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Now let's hear some more pages and go over to Deuteronomy in chapter 9. Now some of you are being rebellious and don't want to turn, but you just have to answer to God for that. But turn and follow along. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. And when I went up to the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant which the Lord had made with you, then, then I stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights, I neither ate bread nor drank water. Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words which the Lord has spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. Thus, when we talk about the Old Covenant, we are talking about the Ten Commandments and also all those Levitical laws. But we're focusing in on the Ten Commandments in this lesson. How they were written, and they were written on tablets of stone. That's an important key. That's an important thing to remember. If you're studying with someone and you're talking about covenants, especially when you're going to try to show them that there is a new covenant and that new covenant leaves out the Ten Commandments, you need to concentrate on those tablets of stone. Written on tablets of stone. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 31, and we read that, we won't reread it, but what can we learn from this passage here? First, the Lord will make a new covenant. He made this covenant with Israel on the mountain of God. He took it and He wrote it on stones. 
by the finger of God it was written on stones. Thus the Lord made uh, this old covenant, but the Lord will make a new covenant. And by the way, that's the first time that, that it appears in the Bible. In the new Testament, the phrase or the words new covenant appears nine times and four of those times in the book of Hebrews, and we're going to concentrate in that very shortly. Concentrate on that. Not according to the old covenant. In other words, it's going to be something new. He's not going to take part of it and, 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 and synchronize the two together as many do today. If you look at the Roman Catholic Church, they're a synchronized religion. They got a little bit of the old covenant, and they got a little paganism, they got a little bit of New Testament, and they try to put it all together. Well, that doesn't work. That's not the new covenant. So it's not according to the old covenant. It is a heart written covenant. Not going to be written on stone. We're going to write it on our hearts. And we learn in this covenant here that God will forgive their sins and never remember them again. Now let's hear some more papers moving and go to the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 10, the Hebrew writer here speaks about the old covenant. In verse 1, he says, For the law, having a shadow, of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. For then would they have uh, not ceased to be offered. For the worshippers once purified would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sin. Every year, under that old covenant, they had to have this sin sacrifice. Now, they had to have a sacrifice if they sinned on a regular basis. They had to go and make a sacrifice. But every year there was this day of atonement where an animal was sacrificed for the nation of Israel. They had to remember that year after year after year after year after year. But under the New Covenant, we don't need to do that. Because we are saved by the blood of Christ and whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. That sacrifice at Calvary, Calvary was, was made once and for all for all of us so that we can have forgiveness of sins. He's not going to remember those sins on a yearly basis like that Old Covenant. Well, we look at the New Covenant. Look at Hebrews in chapter 9, verse 15 to 17. He says, for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant. This is one of those four times. So we talk about in the book of Hebrews where the new covenant is referenced. And by the way, the Hebrew writer quotes uh, Deuteronomy 31, 31 through 34. And he says here in, 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 the, in the book of Hebrews, says this is what he's talking about. Quotes it exactly. He says, for he is the mediator of the new covenant by the means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, by those who are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Now, from this passage, he is, for this reason, the mediator of the new covenant. He is the Go between. That's what a mediator is. Go between God and man through this new covenant. And by the way, I like to sing that song, There's Power in the Blood. Boy, that song has a tremendous message, but this verse here in verse 15 just tells us how powerful that blood is. For that blood is retroactive, it went all the way back through history. Covering the sins of all the people that that old law couldn't do. Remember now? They had to have a remembrance of sin every year. The Hebrew writer said in verse 10, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sin, but the blood that was shed at Calvary, the power in that blood can take away sin. It was retroactive and proactive. And it will go all the way to the end of time through His blood. Now, as we look at this, what happened to the Old Covenant? See, now this is important. It's a very important question. If you study with anybody about covenants, 
It's going to come somewhere down to this here when they're going to say, well, what happened to the old covenant? Well, it was obsolete and ready to vanish away. According to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, this here page term. It says, in that he says, a new covenant. There it is. There's that new covenant referenced again. We've already established back in Jeremiah 31. And we also read it here just a second ago in, in, in chapter 9. Here it is in chapter 8. He says, a new covenant. He has made the first covenant obsolete. What now is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. In trying to pull out an illustration of something obsolete, I came up, and it's probably going to be a very poor one, but can you all remember back in the 50's and 60's if you got you a soda, you had to have you a can opener or a bottle opener? Had a bottle opener on one end and a can opener on the other end. So a can, you open the soda with the bottle opener or the can opener. And companies would make those things, give them away, and use them as a way of advertising. Well, why don't they do that today? I mean, that's a very cheap form of advertising. Well, people make fun of them, wouldn't they? Well, that thing's obsolete. What bottles are we going to open up today? We just twist the cap. What cans are we going to open today? You just pop the can. That's an obsolete thing. You'll not see a can opener, a bottle opener, on the market. Well, people are not making them. It's obsolete. Don't use it anymore. Well, the Hebrew writer says here that that old covenant is obsolete. You don't use it anymore. It's being put back for the new covenant. Next we see that it was changed. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12 is for the priesthood being changed and necessity. There's also a change of the law. Now Michael kind of introduced the priesthood of Christ a little bit this morning. And it is a magnificent study. And if you study the book of Hebrews... It is a study of the superiority of Christ. Superiority of Christ over the prophets, the very first three verses. The study of superiority of Christ over the angels. The study of Christ's superior priesthood over the Levitical priesthood. That Jesus is a priest today according to the order of Melchizedek. Not according to the order of Aaron because under that old covenant, for a person to be a priest, he had to be of the tribe of Levi, descended from Aaron. And the Hebrew writer goes to the extreme saying, hey, Christ is our priest today. He was of the tribe of Judah. Therefore, reason will tell you that we have to have a new covenant. He couldn't be a priest under that old covenant. So it has changed. So that we could have Jesus as our high priest. Aren't we all glad of that? that we have a high priest today who can sympathize with our sufferings and our temptations because he lived and was tempted and he did not sin. Next, we see that it was annulled because of weaknesses and unprofitable. Look at verse 18. For on the one hand, there is annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. In other words, to annul means to cancel out completely. That's what that means. In other words, that old covenant, that law of Moses, those ten commandments were annulled, canceled out completely. Now as we look at this and we continue to ask the question, well, what happened to the old covenant? Well, it was nailed to the cross. Now I'll turn to the book of Colossians if you would. And we want to look at Colossians in chapter 2 and verse 14. Having, write, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, having taken down the way, having nailed it to the cross. Well, if you're studying with people and you just stop right there, they're going to say, well, where does that say anything about the Ten Commandments? Well, just read the next three verses. For the Bible says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. Now what was one of the Ten Commandments? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And that's Saturday. 
And by the way, there are still some members of the church that think that Sunday is the Christian Sabbath. It's not. Sunday is the first day of the week. It's the Lord's day. It's the day He came up out of the grave. So we can see that this whole system was nailed to the cross. We can also see that we are no longer under that covenant. Now turn to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. It had a purpose but we're no longer under it. So what happened to the old covenant? Well, it served its purpose. We're not under it. It was nailed to the cross. Now let's just look at a contrast here between the old and the new. In eastern Kentucky, there's a Pentecostal group up there and they call themselves the Full Gospel Church. Now, you might say, well, that sounds good. But you better get the definition of what they term as gospel. For they call the full gospel the Old and the New Testament together. And they know that New Testament Christians or the Church of Christ preaches that you must follow that New Covenant, the New Testament. And they say, no, now we follow the full gospel. Well, they don't. For you see, under that old covenant, multiple marriages were allowed. David had a number of wives, didn't he? Solomon had a number of wives. He, he collected wives like we collect coins and stamps today. <laughs> he had a number of I don't see how he could afford, you had to be a king to afford to buy shoes for all those wives. You know? But under the new covenant, the apostle Paul said, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. One. Go back through chapter 19. The Lord makes real close attention. He goes back and establishes the married relationship the way God intended it. In other words, let each man be joined. Let man and woman be joined together and let them stay. Under that old cup, they had burnt off. Every year the priest would, would come up and, and he would lay his hands on that animal and they would kill it and then they'd take another animal lay its hands on it to escape goat and take it out into the wilderness. Every year they had to do that. But under this new covenant we had one sacrifice and that was Jesus Christ. And our sacrifice is a living sacrifice. According to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Present your body a living sacrifice. We live each day sacrificing our life to Christ. Putting the world behind us and putting Jesus before us. That's the new covenant. They were forbidden to eat certain meats. Now, if you guys like catfish, well, you can't keep the old covenant because they couldn't eat catfish. Because under the old covenant, you cannot eat fish unless it has scales. And if you like those biscuits and gravy that's made from sausage... I know there's one or two preachers in here who's had a few of those. Well, you couldn't eat it because under that old covenant you couldn't eat pork. You couldn't eat sausage or bacon. I never got invited to any biscuits and gravy this trip. And it's kind of bothered me. <laughs> but under the new covenant, Grady, read chapter 4, verses 1 to 5 for me. We're glad that's in there. See, now you can have that sausage on your biscuit and not be bothered about it. Well, if you want to say, well, we've got to keep the old covenant, then they better, better not send them down here to McDonald's getting sausage biscuit. Well, under that old covenant, they had a priesthood. 
Aaron was a high priest, and the high priest traded himself back to him, but yet under this new covenant, Jesus Christ is our high priest. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And that's what the high priest was, a mediator. So under the new covenant, Jesus is our high priest. They kept the Sabbath. Well, we saw, as we read there in Colossians, that the Sabbath was nailed to the cross. And under that old covenant, they killed the children. I'd like to see one of those guys that say we keep the, the, the full gospel or, or some of those people that stick the Ten Commandments up in the front yard say we keep the Ten Commandments because if you keep part of the law, you have to keep all the law. And according to Deuteronomy chapter 21, 18 to 21, if a man and a wife had a rebellious son, they were to take him to the elders of the city. Look, our son here, he's rebellious, he's a glutton, he's a drunkard, and they stone him to death. Boy, wouldn't the news like to pick up on something like that? And that's just not being happening today because I guarantee you it would be on, on your 6 o'clock news or 5 o'clock news and they might even have breaking news on that one. So and so had the elders of the city stoned their son to death because he was a drunkard. Well, it would keep the morticians pretty busy, wouldn't it? But today, we don't put our children to death. We patiently, kindly work with them. Not that they didn't do it back then, according to Deuteronomy chapter 4, they were to teach their children. Under the Old Covenant, they kept the Ten Commandments. Now open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is a long reading. But brethren, you cannot read this passage here and come away with any conclusion except that the Ten Commandments has done away. Starting with verse 6, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. There it is again. Introduced back in Deuteronomy chapter 31, or in Jeremiah chapter 31. We've already picked it up in Hebrews. Here it is in 2 Corinthians, he says, We're ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, and the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones... Now, remember when we read back here in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 9 about the covenant that was written on stone, written with the finger of God, and that was the Ten Commandments? That's the only covenant that's written on stone in the Bible that I'm aware of. Are there any others? No. Only one's written on stone. So we're talking about the Ten Commandments here. Now let's start verse 7 again. It's important. And if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of spirit not be more glorious. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what was passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses who put the veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Covenant because the veil was taken away in It says that Ten Commandments written and engraved on stone is taken away in Christ. Brethren, you need to be prepared to teach people that. That's a powerful passage when it talks about this new covenant. This new relationship that we have. And by the way, God knew when He established that old covenant that the new covenant was coming. From the foundations of the world, talks about the book of Ephesians. talks about the church was in the mind of God from the foundations of the world. So there's a big contrast between the old and the new. 
Well, the well, purpose of the Old Covenant. Now let's go back to the book of Galatians, if you would. In Galatians in chapter nine and verse chapter three and verse nineteen, it says, What purpose then does the law serve? See, that's the question. What the purpose of the old covenant? What purpose then did it serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through the angels by the hand of a mediator. The law had a purpose. It was to bring the Jewish people to the seed, to the Christ. So they can have their sins removed and not have to offer those animal sacrifices year by year. Can you imagine all the animals that were sacrificed under that system? All the blood that was shed. And then imagine the blood well, as John the Immerser said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Well, what purpose then? The purpose of the new covenant. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation. That's the purpose of the new covenant. It's God's power to save. Let's just repeat that. It's God's power to save. This is why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life that no man cometh through the Father except by me. You can't go by the Ten Commandments. No, you've got to go by Jesus Christ. You can't go by animal sacrifice. No, you've got to go by Jesus Christ. You can't go by Mohammed. You've got to go by Jesus Christ. Can't go by Buddha. Got to go by Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, we can't go it on our own. For in that new covenant, we have salvation. 